Hello and welcome back for season two of the SRA Grid Report. Bailey, how are you doing, buddy? I am doing fantastic. Happy to be back for another season. Glad we did not get canceled. Yes, as of my cancel culture, I decided to overlook our podcast for a season. And yeah, thankful to be back. It's great to be here. That live show was a lot of fun. Thanks to everybody who came out. Um, Definitely hope to do that again. Um, And judging by the attendance alone, I think you guys would enjoy it as well. So pester those admins and let's make sure we end off the season with one too. But... uh, this week we're gonna start. We're we're gonna go over season six. Everything new that's coming this coming your way. All the stuff that got revealed on the live stream on Saturday. We've got. We're gonna take a look over all six divisions of racing because we did just have week one on Tuesday and Wednesday night. And at the end of things, we're gonna have a peer back over the pond at our European friends because Formula One's right around the corner, and there's been quite a bunch of news going on there. I don't know if you've had to look at any of it, Bailey. Uh, it's it's been all over the place, and not just lately. It's since <laughs> since the end of last season, people leaving, people going to different places. So, going to be uh, touching up on that. Definitely, and uh, the that interesting topic of the new, I don't know what you would call it, regulation by Formula One about drivers not being able to express their opinions has been quite the hot topic lately. For sure. We've been seeing a lot of drivers themselves come out about their feelings for it. Um, We'll see if if we bring our our personal opinions into it. But um, yeah, definitely a very major key talking point right now in the Formula One slash racing world. Not a doubt. Not a doubt. And we'll make sure we bring that bring that up later. But for now, let's let's take a look at the season's calendar. Season six, posing to be our biggest season yet. By a long shot. I mean, we didn't expand on divisions this year, or this round, but we do have six full divisions. And by full, I mean 50 drivers registered for every division. I think there may be one or two spots left at this point somewhere. I think D3 has no wait list. Um, We've got quite a wait list as well. Um, But the schedule. A lot of tracks we haven't raced at in quite a while. Uh, Barcelona, everybody loves. Misano in the dry is going to be a nice treat. Brands Hatch for the first time since season one, if I'm not correct, or if I'm not wrong. Um, and everybody's eyes went straight to week eight, that's for sure. Silverstone, that is a night wet race. As if we didn't just talk about how that probably won't happen. Because every time we talk about something that won't happen, or ah, no, that's not how it's going to go down. We end up getting it. So they threw that on the calendar. And to go with yeah, it all, did. yeah, and to go with it all, we got uh, some nice special events as always, with the five hours of Imola coming up in March, we've got the nice GT3 and GT4 multi-class, big grid, SRA and ESR merger slash partner slash joint event, whatever you would like to call it, on March 31st, and a undescribed Hungaro ring endurance at the start of April. This uh, this season looks to be one of the most exciting yet, and we've only been through one week. How how are you feeling about it? Um, overwhelmed. I think. <laughs> um, to me, this this season's been awfully secretive. They haven't been telling us what the track conditions are of each week. Um, they just kind of tell us what the overall condition will be. Um. Barcelona turning out to be nearly 47 to 45 degrees on track. Um, definitely through it was the strategy definitely came into play for the first time. I feel in a long time in SRA that um, I, that I completely agree with. Yeah. So, and the fact that they're giving us, they're telling us a week in advance um, for <laughs> not only the weather, but the pit windows as well. That's right. So we weren't told what the pit window was going to be for season six, but we were told that Barcelona was going to have a 40 minute pit window. So that's what we saw for round one. We still haven't heard about what it's going to be for Misano yet. We do have the off week for Valentine's, but I don't know. Like this is kind of nerve wracking. I mean, that can change your whole strategy and how you approach the week. For sure. And it'll definitely affect how you practice as well. That is for sure. 
Now, they didn't give us specifics on what the temperature was going to be for Misano, but the servers are up already. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been to that race server, but 11-11, make a <laughs> wish, because we're going to need a wish it's to get through brutal. that race. Yeah, it's going to be a lot different than what we were just doing. No doubt. I, I'm making... My first lap, I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to make the same Barcelona adjustments just in the other direction for tire pressures. <laughs> yeah. And within yeah. for, within two laps, I'm like, nope, I still need more. I did the exact same thing, even in the quali server. Yeah, it's a quali server is about 16 degrees track temperature. And yeah, it's it's cold. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting because this, this track is definitely, um, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's easy on tires. Um, I don't know how the Aston Martin is. I mean, we could talk about this later, but um, just kind of practicing, I've I've noticed that even with the tire temps being so, or not the temps, the PSIs being so low, your tire your tire temps are going to be kind of colder. It's it's still not going to be nice for an entire hour. I, I yeah, that's bang on the money, man. And those yeah. outlaps are going to be just as crudal, cru critical, crudal, critical and crucial put together. Let's take that off my lexicon. Um, <laughs> it's it's going to be critical to be gentle with those tires because when they don't have grip, they don't have grip, and sliding is damage. So, sure, yeah, and I've noticed that this especially is because um, I'm going to be running, assuming that the track is going to get colder, as it is a uh, dusk uh, race. So I'm just preparing for the temps to get lower. So uh, any slide could potentially cause your tire temps to, to go higher than you'd like and getting them down is not going to be an easy task without losing time dead right dead right this is going to oh. be a interesting season as we're getting told on the fly how things are going to roll yeah and yeah like i said we don't have the pit window yet but this uh yeah the schedule has uh given us no advantages. I don't think there's any car that has a direct advantage to this calendar. No, I mean, or even a direct it's all disadvantage. Over the place. Like last, exactly. like last season, it was very much a if you're in a McLaren, you've got to be on the money. Yeah. This season, it's like, well, I mean, we're all just kind of screwed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, we we definitely saw that after week one. Yes. Yes, we did. And before we move into week one, we do have one other thing that has been brought out to us with the start of season six and everything getting kicked off for 2023. The multi-class mayhem season number four is returning Friday in our off week. So during Valentine's, we're going to see round one at Donington. Now, I don't remember if we went over this or not because it was released when we did the last episode, but I'll go over it again. We're running six rounds this season, and the I believe it's the even-numbered races are going to be, so round two, four, and six are going to be the typical 90-minute race, one mandatory pit, one liter of fuel required. The odd number rounds, one, three, and five, are going to be two 30-minute sprint races back-to-back -back with no required pit. So it's going to be a little bit of a shake-up. This is kind of to bridge the gap between things like GT4s that can run whole races without refueling and GT3s that are pretty much plagued by needing to, especially at 90 minutes. But uh, it's going to it's gonna bring some spice. I know I'm excited to get back into it. going to drive a GT3. Well, there you go. Are you taking part, Bailey? I I might. I'm not. I, I'm 100% sure that I can't make every week, but I think the weeks that I can, I will probably participate myself. That's awesome. I mean, it's a, so, it's a whole lot of fun. Yeah, I uh, agree. But definitely learned my lesson and not going back in a GT4. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just being in a GT4 just kind of shows the, the guys that keep going back to it. Evan Kim especially, I feel like he's always in a GT4. Oh, yeah. When we, when we talk about the GT3 series and Aliens, we go straight to Ryan Yee and Matt Lehman yep. and Jeff Spangler and people of that variety. When we go to multi-class, GT4, it's Evan or bust. Exactly. People come in and they go, oh, Kim's here? I don't have a chance. Yeah. So, yeah. Just the the way people talk about GT4 is even even yourself um, can attest to this after doing a full season. Was it a full season or did you do like half the events? I did three quarters. That's right. That's right. 
uh, a lot of people say have said that it's uh it's 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 tough. Yeah, it's definitely it's, a learning curve. Yeah. It's a very odd I find it an odd mid ground between GT three and like Cup. Because you have the car feels like it wants to act like a GT three, and then mm -hmm. just when you get the confidence, it's like, hey, wait, we don't got brakes. Hey, wait, no. we don't got suspension. Yeah, and let alone you got these GT threes that have everything that are trying to race around you. Yeah, it's, I I remember driving Silverstone, being in a GT three, and having to try and make a pass, uh, at to uh, coming into Cops. That's where it was. No, coming into mm -hmm. Maggots. And it was actually Doug. I was coming up on him, and I'm like, okay, you know, my closing distance, my relative speed, I should get him in about a corner and a half. So closer to the exit, we'll meet up, you know, let off the throttle, pass him on the straight. No. By the time I got to Beckett's, I was on his butt because I didn't realize those cars need to break. Yeah, they do. They need to drop, like, two gears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they. Uh, it's harder to throw those around, even though it's uh, slower speeds, so... Yeah, but again, yeah. a learning curve and a whole bunch of fun, especially once you start to get the, get the hang on them. Those lower grade, lower spec cars are just a hoot. Yeah, so for sure. Looking forward to that coming back for sure, and keep your eyes on the Imola event as we'll probably start to see towards. I don't know, maybe next week, the week after, we'll probably see things like more information, maybe a registration link coming out. But that that second week of March will come up on us pretty fast. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to throw a question to you before we move on here. Yep. Um, of all of Season 6, what are you looking forward to the most? Ooh, that is tough. See, actually, you know what? Silverstone. Silverstone. I am very excited for the night wet race. I Especially if we actually get, like, nighttime nighttime for once. Because... Like, true nighttime races are exhilarating. Like, it's scary when you get away from cars and you can't see anything. But when you're yeah. side by side and ju juking and jiving out behind somebody, the flashing lights is just... It gets your gets the blood flowing. And now you're going to throw rain into the mix. In the UK, yeah. where it's typically heavier rain. So mm -hmm. we're going to have a hard time probably not flooding that track. Yep. And uh, cold temperatures. So... <laughs> I think that's going to be a whole bunch of fun and just really exciting to watch from the booth. So Silverstone's what I'm most excited for. I definitely think that one's going to be the most intense race of the season. I agree with you on that. See, you say um, that, but that Barcelona race I just had, was I, I'm up there chalking it as my most intense race yet. Wow. Like, at, like of all the seasons? In my time at SRA, my time competing uh, in Gran Turismo Sport... Like, wow. it's, uh, I don't think I've had that quality of racing, and we'll get to the splits when we get there, but, like, we had 30, what was it, 36 drivers or something like that in qualifying split by a second? 40. 40. Yeah, the top 40 was split by exactly one second. And that kind of pace was still evident in the race. Everybody yes. was just so tight, it was, it was a race. So I think this whole season is going to be a season of quality racing, but Silverstone will be a hoot. What about yourself? For sure. Oh, um, I'm I'm honestly very curious about what the Hungaro Ring endurance is going to be because in in any racing game, Hungary, the Hungaro Ring is one of my favorite tracks to race at. Um, I like I find myself more of a technical driver, so the technicality of Hungaro Ring, the uh, the technicalities that it throws at you, I love because it's so challenging. Um, whatever the endurance is i i think is going to be next next level i yeah. think in my opinion so I, I think i'm most curious about that but i'm also really excited for the uh sra and esr combination big grid race at suzuka yeah big grids at suzuka are always a whole bunch of fun and to get the opportunity to do the joint event with esr just adds a whole another level of excitement yeah really excited to do that Especially after the uh, ONID um, Transatlantic Cup yeah. um, race event that we did as well. So following that up, I think will be awesome. No doubt. And that's another thing to keep your eyes on. Moving to our races for the week. 
Division 6, starting where we always start, saw a record attendance of, I want to say, 45 drivers. They had almost the entire division show up. I don't think everybody did. I don't think any division was, had all of the drivers close. show up. But it was very close. There was several divisions with 48. Yeah, 48, yeah. I think, was the highest. And And they showed, again that these bottom divisions are going to be not bottom feeders, but bottom fighters. Yeah. And put on quite the show. Qualifying, we saw Julio Badon III take pole with a 146-0. Now, like, up in the... As soon as we hit D3 and then start going forward, you'll be like, hey, wait, these all could have been in the same place. But yeah. Division Six, Division Five, Division Four, all of them could have been close to the same spots in qualifying. the The pace was very tight and very high this week, and that came from a NSX taking the pole position. He held it out and managed to take the win, followed up by Patrick Brady, who qualified in second, and Justin Rose, who qualified in third. So a fairly straightforward race for the top three, but I heard that it was not straightforward for most of the division. No, it definitely was not. Um, I'd say getting down to turn one, there was 11 cars that made it. Oh, that's... Yeah. So last season's D6 made it to turn one? It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Yeah, that's uh, that, it was pretty bad. It was very, very bad. You want to know something, um, something else that's funny before... Sorry to interrupt you. No, you're good. When we first started SRA, season zero, our first race was at Barcelona. We also oh. had a high portion of the grid be involved in a accident before we got to turn oh, one. My goodness! And the farthest they got was the end of the pit lane. <laughs> yeah, that was about where we got to. It yeah. was just after oh. the pit lane, and all hell broke loose. Ninety percent of the yeah. grid sideways, but yeah. that's just Barcelona. It is. You don't even have to take turns to get into an accident. Nope. Yeah, it was pretty brutal, but. From those involved, I mean, I we've heard some, you know, it was crazy, it was this and that, but once the dust settled, settled on the night, everyone's just itching for that second round. They're all like, that was a lot of fun. Like, the racing, the, the closeness, the battles, the, it was a good battle. And it's nice to see that they actually have more people now. Uh, I, yeah. don't th I still think the stream's not up at the moment from the last time I checked, but I'm definitely looking forward to go watch that one. I... I don't know if they had anybody recording D6. Oh, that's um, a shame then. I'll have to check, but I'm not sure. I think the host, whoever was the host, couldn't make it oh, uh, no. this week. So, yeah. That's a shame. Well, Hopefully D6, we still on. love you. We promise. I just can't. I, I have nowhere to, nowhere to watch the race from. I'm sorry. <laughs> Usually just the replay. I just take a, take a peek at the uh, the replay there. That's a good idea. I never thought about that using the next cloud of all of the replays that the league has and just popping it in the computer and watching it that way. Broadcasters do too good of a job though. Exactly. Division way better. Yeah. Division five sees the return of Cube Master taking pole to start to start things off. Really really given a threat that he wants he wants a stab at the overall championship this time, not just the silver championship, with a forty-five four seven five, which was less, which was a quarter of a tenth off of second, and that was half a tenth off of third. So very, very close in D five for qualifying, and the race sees some more returning drivers come up to the pole. Ian Byron takes the win in the Lexus this season. With a one forty, uh, with the fastest lap of a one forty six one, and that's what I kind of mean. Like these these divisions are so close, so close on pace. Mm -hmm. Six could have competed with five. Two could have competed with one. It's it's all over, and we'll probably see some people moving as uh, as week two and week three come around, and we do this little bit of equalization. We also saw Sean Daniels come home in second place, and Gordon Beverly, who I'm. I may be mistaken, but I believe is newer to the league. Putting two armamentario drivers on the podium. Uh, D5 was insane. And insane. Like, you take 
D2's qualifying tight, like closeness, and you put it on the D5 race, like there were packs of, there were, there were trains of, I don't know, five, seven, ten cars till the 40 minute mark. Like the field did not spread. Wow. Until, until like 80% of the people pit. And then it started to spread. Um, my heart goes out to Jitesh Katavkar. Uh, he was absolutely driving his bottom off. Uh, held off behind, I think it was Byron, when he was when Jitesh was in second. Waited for the right opportunity. Finally got past and did not look back. Broke out into the lead. Got a massive gap. And near the end of the race, um, had a bit of an accident at turn four, I think it is, the hairpin. Mm -hmm. five sorry the left-hander hairpin downhill and the uh little bit of an oversteer hit the wall and had hit a back marker that was pulling off to the side for a car coming by Jeez. so he got damaged had a longer pit brought him all the way back and sadly we didn't see him on the podium but he had that wind locked up he had a huge gap and just that pit was too long byron on the other hand although he lost the position early when when those packs stayed tight, he just patiently waited in the Lexus, played on what I think is the perfect strategy in a, on a track where it's hard to overtake and just, just sit in their mirrors, be there for the opportunity. And at one point, the opportunity opened and he jumped like three or four positions that ended up netting him first place. That's incredible. Yeah, it was just a very intelligent drive from the Lexus and D5 and all around like... <laughs> That that division just trying to take the top spot, like saying, "Hey, yeah, just take take the big boys off Twitch, put us up there, because we need some attention." Look at this. They definitely, I I definitely think they they did that. Um, there's a lot of very very good drivers in D5, so I expected nothing less from D5. Yeah, that. If they're jam packed with people who have the capability of being in D three, like, and that's not a, not a statement one way or the other. Just mm -hmm. a, there again, it's so tight that, like that, there are a lot of quality, like very skilled drivers there. They just maybe not have the one lap pace to be up with the fourth division, but their quality of racing could be up with three or two. Absolutely. The beauty of the divisions, man. It's just. I love it. I love it. And and like we said last week, the splits from first to the bottom in each division is so close that a tenth could move you, uh, a, a division could move you 10, 15 spots. It's it's ridiculous how close everything is this season. It just It's so difficult as well. It is. And I think that's, there's no way I'd rather have it like keep the competition close keeps you on your toes you miss a week you might miss some points exactly or even if you uh don't miss a week and don't see the end of the race yeah uh, yeah well same uh, situation we'll ask you to elaborate on that one in a little bit here <laughs> okay <laughs> division four we see a poll time from josh schlitz of a 144.72 in the aston martin and I think from here forwards is where we start to see a lot of a lot more Astons on the podium. But mm -hmm. he, once again, just like some of the other divisions, held on and took himself the win. Austin White Scarver came home in second place. And Colin Durham, Dunham came home in third. H how, did, uh, how did D4 fare? Were they as uh, hectic? Um... There was a turn one incident when it was not it was maybe three cars involved, but it wasn't it wasn't horrible. Um, but the first lap after that was kind of chaos. Uh, everybody's trying to slot in. Everybody's trying to get some early moves done. Uh, a lot of people went off. We didn't have any major accidents, luckily. Um, but the strategy this week um, that was the big topic of conversations across SRA. Um, I'm not sure how D5 turned out. Um, but what we noticed was that in Division 4, um, taking tires ultimately ended up not being the move. Um, Caleb Craig actually took tires, was in the lead, and took tires and uh, didn't even finish on the podium. 
Wow. Yeah, yeah, there was actually quite a few drivers in D5 who took tires. Yeah. Um, one that I'd like to point out is Austin Whitescarver. Um, didn't take tires. Um, said sometime this week that Barcelona is one of his favorite tracks. He does all of his preseason testing, uh, what cars he's going to use. So to see him up on the podium in P2, I think is is very good to see. I think he earned it. Um, so it's really good to see him. I hope he keeps that pace throughout the season, but uh, unbelievable race from him. Yeah, that's a that's a great drive. And it's always For nice sure. when you can have your, your personal favorite on the calendar as well. Gives you that mm-hmm. little bit of a competitive edge. So yeah, very Absolutely. well deserved. Absolutely. And and starting your season off with one of your favorite tracks, I think keep starts you off on a high note and uh hope you can keep the momentum going throughout the whole season. Most definitely. There there's but, no there's no better foot to start off on. Yeah. I mean, even looking at these these qualifying times the top three could have qualified in the top twenty in D two. Yeah, this is uh, this is where things start to spice up. Exactly, like the next four divisions, three divisions, depending on the track, anybody can land in any of these divisions. <laughs> it's, it's what's crazy. Yeah, like I going to next week's track, like Misano. I went and put in a lap, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm two seconds off the pace. And then I went and checked my set of course stats, and I'm like. Well, that was almost my PB on the track, so I guess oh, I'm no. going to have a lot of work to do. Yeah. I mean, thankfully, I jumped a bunch of time. I've gotten... That was a 35.7, by the way. And now I'm down to about a 34.2 or 44.2, whatever yeah. it is. But you get what I'm saying? So Yeah, I've been putting in the work myself. Uh, uh, gotten myself down to a 33.5. There you go. So, But yeah, see. this is... Uh, any track... Any uh, one one track, you could be strong at it. You you could place quote unquote place two divisions above yourself. You could not have a track, have bad luck there. Maybe you just haven't driven there sometimes. Do your laps and stuff, and it's like I should be in D six. Yeah, for sure. But um, that could also be a matter of one to two seconds. <laughs> yeah, it could. Yeah, I I and remember I think... at the start of D five or D four when we first brought it on, it was like. A significant pace difference between D1 and D6. Now it's like nothing. No, like I, like I said, anybody could end up any, anywhere depending on the track and the driver combination. You got it. So let's look at one of these uh, alien esque times here and have a peek at the D3 qualifying board. I'm gonna go all th- go over all three here because it's uh, it's worth mentioning. Aaron Anderson taking pole. With a 144.0. CJ Meeks taking second with a 144.3. And Zach Dupuy in third with a 144.5. All three of those are what? Top 10 D2 quality? Uh, damn I mean, near close. I mean, the 40, 44.5 might have been close. But 44.3 is pr- pretty close to what I got. And I was 7th. And then forty four zero two zero would have been pole by yep. a tenth. Yeah, that's unreal. It it's insane. Uh, looking at the race, CJ Meeks managed to bring himself to first place and take the win. Sam Reck coming from out of nowhere to take second, and Aaron Anderson dropping down for third place. Uh, D three, I hadn't, I did not get the chance to watch, but. Uh, I would love to see what happened there because I don't know like another Aston Zach Dupuy like what happened it's uh, he traded places with his teammate like they had both of them at the start up top but mm-hmm. did one elect for tires I'm not sure uh, could be um, just kind of looking at the uh, the race time here um, I'm not sure what the fastest lap in the race was but the fastest laps in the race, uh, Aaron Anderson definitely had the quickest one. So um, I'm just going to th- say, guess, um, ad- estimate here that Aaron Anderson did take tires, would be my guess. Could be. And just to take tires, if the field around him did not, and to bring it back to third, well driven. For sure. For sure. Great, great race for him and CJ Meeks taking home. Definitely the uh, the week one team 
win there as well, for sure. No way around it. No doubt. The uh, the Tequila Sunrise TRD are off to a great start. Division 2. Qualifying sees Ken Thomas take pole with a 44-1. Gomer Wilson takes second with a 44-1. And Ronya Over take third with a 44-1. Um... <laughs> First and second were split by five thousandths, and second and third were split by fifteen thousandths. Yeah. So yep. it was, it was worth saying it like that. Like you could look, I don't know, five ten spots down the grid, and maybe then you'll start to, or no, two three spots down, you'll see a one oh one forty four three, and then it's quite a bit until you see a forty forty four four. It was uh, extremely yeah. tight. Yeah, you don't see a 45 until after the 40th position. Yeah, and that's, like, they probably just didn't get an optimal lap, or that was their their banker or something like that. Yeah, I know I had tire issues. I was towards the back there. I was having, my PSIs were running way too high, so I was was way off the pace. Yeah, qualifying was something that was very hard to get down for Barcelona, and personally, I'm surprised where I got mine, but, you know... Sometimes you just got to take it when things don't show up for a week and then show up on race day. Yeah. Especially when they're not spinning. It's lapping properly. Mm -hmm. Or lapping at all. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. But in the race that Bailey keeps alluding to, because his was faster than, uh, I don't know, Quicksilver, Runya Over takes the win in the Aston Gomer Wilson holds on to second and uh hey wait a minute wasn't this guy in D4 Kelvin Lau takes third I'll correct you and say Kevin Lau started in D5 I know make me feel worse that man <laughs> has got some skill he is kind of sus kind of sus sussy wussy <laughs> somebody saw Kelvin vent no yeah um he is he is a very talented driver like all jokes aside that's that's all love, man. You you deserve it. Hell of a drive. Um, mm-hmm. Very interesting race. I don't think we really had any huge accidents. There were a bunch of like dispersed small accidents. Yeah. Uh, Bailey, why don't you why don't you tell us about your short story of a race? Well, let me tell you, everybody, it's a long story. Uh, lap one, we'll start in qualifying. Qualifying didn't go as well as I hoped. Started P thirty eight. Uh, next to me was my teammate, Taylor, P39, with the exact same qualifying time. Uh, kind of annoyed me. That's kind of um, sus. Yeah, we got to uh, we got to the start there. I, unfortunately, was still on the bend of the final turn before, while the, the lights went out. Um, yeah, it was not, not fun. So there are a lot of people didn't get the jump immediately. So um, I got kind of past a couple, and then I slotted in, was patient, I know I have a couple of penalty points, so I slot in, I lift before we get to the end of the pit lane, um, trying to play it safe, and then all of a sudden, 350, 400 meter mark, um, people in front of me are 100% on full brakes, and uh, uh, caught me out, <laughs> and I uh, ended, I had about a minute 20 in damage, so I said, well, I ain't gonna make this up, so I called the quits, oh, unfortunately, yeah, that is... I was a lap down by the time. That's not all the way done. you want to start off your season. No, it's not. So I unfortunately had to observe the Division Two race this week. It's uh, it's always a shame when you try so hard to predict what's going to happen at the start. And, you know, you try and be cautious, and then someone else being cautious, and then you both come together, and then things happen, and then yeah. one of you hits the wall. It's like, but we just wanted to make it out alive. How did we still kill each other? Yeah, and and the the unfortunate thing was, I told Taylor before we even started qualifying. I said I have a very bad feeling about this week, um, and sure as hell, what I called happened. <laughs> it reared its head. Uh, but anyways, who do you pick for the Super Bowl? Um, <laughs> <laughs> who do who should I not pick for the Super Bowl? How about that? Ah, uh, there you go. Mahomes already got his uh, MVP, so give it to the Falcons. Exactly. The Falcons or the Eagles? Whatever the birds. <laughs> I I watch I watch rubber rubber circle sports, not not pig pig ovals. 
It's okay. It's essentially the same thing. Yeah, it's close. Uh, the f- from the front half, it wasn't too bad of a race. Uh, I started with I started right beside Kevin Kovach. Um, he's a fellow conglomerate member, so we were working together a little bit of little bit of strategy. I actually bump drafted him down the oh. start straight because I kept catching up to him and I passed yes. him at one point, but I couldn't like he was faster everywhere except for the str- start finish straight than me and the last mm-hmm. sector. So I I said I said to him, "You know what? You go. Chill cut behind us is catching up. They're piling up behind us. This we're both going to lose a bunch of positions here." He wasn't a fan of it, didn't want me to do it, uh, said it afterwards, but just gave him a push down the straightaway. That push ended up bringing me back to Alex and pushing him away from us, so he ran away so oh. free. I was fighting from a life, felt like R. Kelly, just crying <laughs> oh, in the seat. Jesus. I'm fighting from a damn life here, holding on to the position. Um, and then eventually Alex gave way, and I waited till like... 15 minutes left to pit and only took my my liter of fuel uh, i repair repaired the damage that i had i think yeah i did repair the damage that i had uh, a couple seconds from a side impact near the start also with kevin but that was my fault um and i came out of the pits and forgot how to drive like oh, i no. for th- probably four or five laps i couldn't go faster than a 47 7 or oh, 37.7, no. seven, whatever the thing is. 47, you, Okay, yeah. 47. Yeah, I'm like, I don't get it. I'm not pushing that hard. Like, I'm not overworking the tires. I'm hitting my apexes. I'm hitting my braking points, but I can't go fast. And everybody piles up behind me. Kelvin was still behind me at that point. Wow. I lost to uh, Kelvin. I l- had an amazing fight with John Archie, I think is his name. Yep. In the Ferrari, very. Thank you for dealing with me. Uh, I played the uh, driving down the center of the road tactic a lot, um, and I mean it surprisingly works on a track like Barcelona because you don't really know which side would be better. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but very very good battle. Russell Allen near the end there held on to from him from the last battle, but from the last lap. But yeah, like thirty minutes straight of just fighting off. I think there was a train of four cars behind me. So it's a, it was it was a good race, but uh, definitely don't want to drive it for a little while, especially not at those temperatures. I need a yeah, mental break from that. For sure. But yeah, D D two is still the sweat sweaty. division. Like very we, sweaty. We were a lot more spread out, and I mean, like going over this a little bit more because D 2s broadcast got a little bit jangled. We had some technical issues between our commentators and the server. And they couldn't stay connected, but uh, like the the field seemed to spread out relatively early, and was like generally spread out. Still some battles here and there, but not really any big trains until you started to see things like big tire wear or coming out of the pits or someone with new tires catching up to old tires. Because we also had a lot of people take them. Several people, yeah, and that's part of the reason why. I'll tell you what, Gomer Wilson. Although he didn't qualify on pole, he was flying in the race. Yeah, that that Aston was moving. His fastest yeah. lap is three tenths faster than the guy in first and third. Yeah. It, like... So, Gomer Wilson took tires and I think still only got second by five seconds. Yep, f- uh, about five seconds there, five and some tenths. Or, yeah, five seconds ish. But uh, and that's I think something like the Porsche might have needed it. And now I don't know the Porsche. You're a Porsche driver. Well, I haven't really done a race yet in the Porsche, so I, I can't say on that. Right, but <laughs> I guess in terms of tire wear and weight, like a lot of yeah. the guys talk about how when the the fuel tank in the Porsche is in the front, so when you as you wear down on fuel, you get light in the front end, and mm-hmm. then combine that with how brutal the tire wear is at Barcelona. Like I can imagine that yeah. thing be a death trap by twenty minutes. For sure, and the the way to drive the Porsche is you have to throw it around, you have to slide it in through corners. So, I mean, sliding it and throwing it around is already adding a lot of tire wear. Now you add the 45, the 41 degree te- track temperature. It's it's a horrible combination, but um, going into the race, I did so many race stints practice, and I had 100% committed to not taking tires. 
um, my setup, I feel like I tweaked it enough to where um, I felt comfortable for an hour, but <laughs> unfortunately didn't get that far. So I don't know. Unless I'm doing something wrong, then by all means, somebody tell me. But Dr drop yeah. a message down in the Google form down below and let Bailey exactly. know what he's doing wrong. <laughs> tell me I'm shit or something. I don't. I don't Hashtag know. get good scrub. Dead last in D two at the moment. <laughs> I'll hold that for a while. Hey man, somebody's got to do it. It's an honor. Two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not anymore. Hopefully I come back. You will, and you'll come back strong. There's uh, there's a lot of drivers this week who didn't really perform to their usual standards, but week one, everybody is chomping at the bit to race. Everybody is practicing every free moment that they, that they get, and the competition level is always that much higher. Yeah. Our last but definitely not least division, Division 1. Jeff Spangler takes the inaugural pole position with a 43-5. One zero, Nicholas Alvarado takes second with a forty three five one two, and Ryan Yee takes third with a forty three five two seven. So another division extremely tightly split, and that that pole gap of two thousands of a second that's is just nuts unreal. to look at. Like it's that's unreal. Ugh, scary. Yeah. Like, how do you? I mean, we get a lot of instances where people somehow put in the exact same lap time, but like. 2000s together that's just ah oh, i would be i would be shaking my head how where did i lose it <laughs> yeah i mean it's not even that like 2000s isn't even like where i lost it it's like I, I don't even it's it's so minuscule it's so hard to explain how where you lose that because losing it is more than 2000s of a second yeah like where it could that, that it could, could be just a timing be... issue like exactly ping <laughs> yeah oh, that's that's insane caps off it's to crazy them. for sure but then i mean you, you look even farther and you've got run ye 15 or fifteen thousandths as well off of p2 yeah that's just waiting there like the again the competition level this season is through the roof and these, yeah. com these quality numbers are just i could sit here and drool at this yeah. The race saw Ryan Yee take the inaugural win from third place. Taking tires. Proving for once that tires are a working strategy at SRA. For the first time in six seasons, a winner has taken tires. Let's let's also throw out the fact that not only did he take tires, he still won by 18 seconds. That's just like... I don't even know if it's cherry on top or if that's just like get flipping the double bird to your boss as you walk out and quit say, after winning the lottery. The like, <laughs> Yeah, it's unreal. Absolute performance from Ryan showing us once again why he's regarded as the alien around here. For um, sure. And... One of our newcomers, Alexander Shishnov, I'm going to take a guess, uh, placed second place in the NSX. Alex is part of the Armamentario team and is getting the chance to take part in his first GT3 championship with us. He brought himself a second place. Uh, had a significantly faster race lap time than the P3 finisher of Dom Duran uh, by almost a second, about seven tenths. Then you look up the board at Ryan Yee, who did a 43.8 during the race. Oh, that's unreal, dude. Which is... Seven tenths faster than second place did. Yeah. What the heck, man? Like whatever I mean, 43, he's on, I need eight. it. Forty-three eight is quicker than the pole time in D two. Yeah. Like you're doing that with fuel in the car. Now yeah. I want I want to know what stint he did that on. First I would or guess second. the second one. I would guess the second one. As would I, but I mean I guess I would come down to did he split fuel too. Because you can fit, you can almost fit a full tank of gas underneath a tire change. Yeah, I would so. assume he did. It's the smartest move. Um, the one thing I do want to mention is with um, Alexander, who did take P2, and his teammate Alexi, um, both the armamentarial representatives that are in SRA this season, um, happy to have them. Uh, they were definitely the big talk of the offseason as they basically walked into Kailami 
went in, did like six laps, and immediately was the top of the table. Um, Ryan E kind of threw it out there like, hey, this is my place. Yeah, I was going to say, this is my turf. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, super happy to have those guys on board, and it's awesome that they're getting the opportunity to race with us. Uh, they are from well, literally the other side of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So time zones are a little bit different, but um, when they get the chance, it's always a treat because everybody learns something from watching those guys drive, even if they don't take the wins. Their consistency is up there. Yeah. And they, they're smart, too. They play the game a lot. They know what they're doing. So yeah. never say anything that's uh, helpful or gives you a tip. I would definitely listen to what they say. <laughs> Not a doubt. They, uh, they Like you said, they know what they're talking about. Yeah. But that uh that brings the end of week 1 and I I don't really I don't know. It sucks to say the end of week 1 cuz we have 2 weeks to wait, but it's just like I don't want this to stop. The energy yeah. level of the last 3 days, 4 days has just been so high around this league. Especially that Division 5 chat. Yeah, Division 5 are always, always popping off. There was a uh, someone. Someone did the math. Division five chat almost has more messages in itself than the other division chats combined. That's yeah. Like I'm what? No, I think that's correct. I think like, that is correct. I mean, today they've been doing a lot of bread talk, so it's probably up there now. But <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of bread men in there. Oh yeah! Shout out! Shout out the Ohula Cam himself, Patches Ohulahan. Yeah. For uh turning us all into bread aficionados somehow and inflicting voodoo on those he does not like uh yeah just looking here i think uh division if you combine division three division one uh division two and potentially division four it's the same amount as division five wow yeah that is the place to be i spend i spend quite a bit of time in that chat too I just it's it there's so much say you're gone for an hour you miss so much oh yeah you're, it's like 200 missed messages it's been 10 yeah. minutes yep i've always said this that although d6 d5 d4 they may not be the quickest in the league but i do think they have the biggest personalities in in the league 150 percent agree there that's for what for what they lack in speed they make up in socialization they make up for character they make up for their common jokes, their their memes. It's very entertaining. It's awesome. Part of the community I would hate to lose. Absolutely. And it more than likely will grow throughout this year. Oh definitely. We're uh we've already had with the with the way registrations went, we've already had people go, um maybe we wanna make some D seven and D eight logos just in case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So For sure. It's uh that that community is only going to grow. But let's uh let's have a look over yonder. Formula One. The uh liveries are looking pretty cool. We've had a we've Yeah, had a we've few... we've had a couple. Yeah, the the Williams is kind of it's a little bit different. I like that they leaned more into the blue, but mm -hmm. I mean the I, I I think the battery gag on the top is a little stupid. But hey, sponsorships and Duracell. What is it? The Duracell? Yeah, yeah the Duracell. Yeah, it's kind of funny. <clears throat> it's clever. But, well, I mean, we've had what four liveries revealed? I think something Five? like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because the next one is Aston and McLaren on Monday. Yeah. So the Alfa Romeo, I like the red and black. Uh, actually, I think Alpha Tauri is the thirteenth. Hmm. Alpha Tauri is the next one for sure. Okay, I am mistaken. But yeah, the uh, the lean into red and black. the The white was a nice touch for the Alpha Romeo, but the the red black just looks so much more menacing. Mm hmm. And uh, really makes me wonder what the Ferrari is gonna look like. Well, it's funny that you say that. Because tell me it got leaked. Um, a lot. I mean, it's Ferrari. They've been red a lot of the time. Yeah, most of the time, all the time. <laughs> um, rumor is 
It may not be true. I'm just saying, stating a rumor that I saw that uh, Ferrari may be yellow. See, I would love to see that yellow livery again, but Fred Vasseur said that he can't tell us much, but he can say that the car is going to be red. Yeah, people are. I mean, I did see that as well, but maybe he's just saying that to throw people off. Yeah, I w- I will say those all yellow renders of the twenty two car from when they did the special livery that was part yellow. The all yeah. yellow looked sick. I agree, but uh, I think I think they'd get two races into the season, and everybody who doesn't like Ferrari would just be going around calling them Lamborghini, and they'd yeah. change the livery. <laughs> For sure, although. I mean, it'd be it'd be kind of sick because it's a change for once and from Ferrari. But yeah. then again, you can you can't you can't say the same about Red Bull. They had the one white livery that they had for Suzuka. That Otherwise, it's stunning. been the exact same. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, actually, having the notes here that Red Bull revealed their 2026 car when they did when they did the launch. So yeah, with uh, Ford. Yeah, I was gonna say. Speaking of that? Ford coming back to the table, um. You know what? I had about 40 minutes of like, hell yeah, this is awesome. The the original North American like Ford, man. Like they were they were big in Formula 1 when they were here. And then I'm like, is this the F1 going, yeah, fuck you. We don't want a big name American brand giving us real competition to Andretti and Cadillac and just going, we want supplements to make our British brands look better. It could be. Like they like that's got to be a big smack in the face to them. Absolutely, but then another side is you got to look back towards, um, the made like the great twenty four hours of Le Mans race. You've had the old rivalries between Ford and Ferrari. Mm-hmm. Um, Ferrari might as well see that as a flashback to the past. Yeah, realistically as well. Could yeah. be. I mean, it it won't look like a Ford, and no, it, that's I for mean, sure. Who knows? It might look more like one in twenty six, but I doubt it. Uh, yeah, it's it's nice to have have them uh, have them back in that historic rivalry between Ford and the other brands outside of Formula One too. It's a great it's a great history to have back. Yeah. But I feel like I definitely feel like someone like Cadillac with the hybrid technology that they have through like the endurance racing and all that shit that they're getting into now. Uh, Because they've only just started doing that with the new spec series, right? The LMDH or whatever they're called. I believe this is when they've they've really like stepped it up and kind of put invested more into it. Okay, but I believe that's what it is. I see. The the cars and the technology, though, like they're taking a serious stab at trying to make this shit work and having a manufacturer that's also making it work on a different side of the motorsport. Like it, what I'm saying is like, what if someone like Toyota, who has dominated the hybrid endurance for what, like four or five years now? A long, yeah. Like, I think it's the longest streak of victory in that classification. I would believe it. And they... What if they came over and were like, we want to bring a hybrid, we want to bring a team. You really don't want to bring that kind of technology to be at your forefront? Like, think of what they could be pulling out of their ass. Well, I mean, you also got to consider the fact that, look what Honda did. They dominated, and I wouldn't say dominated, they were very highly competitive, and they backed out. So maybe Toyota sees the same thing, like, hey, we want nothing, we don't want to be a part of this. Yeah, it could be. But in the sense of, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the way Formula One is taking, like, yeah, sure, we don't want somebody new. And, I don't know, they're, the teams are upset because of money or something, you know, first world problems. But why would you not want a true OEM that's capable? Like, it's not like somebody who doesn't have hybrid performance or doesn't have a motorsports team of some kind is coming in. Like if I I guess what I'm saying is like if Andretti wanted to partner with the team that's out there, didn't they try and block that too? Wasn't he originally supposed to take a part ownership of Alfa Romeo or something? Um, I remember something along those lines, but not the details. 
I don't. I mean, I don't remember reading anything about it. I'm sure it's true. Um, I think Andretti's just wanted more than just a foot in the door. Yeah, it just. I get. I guess where I'm going is it just seems like F1 wants nothing to do with American competition. They only want the viewership and the money. Yeah, I so, definitely think it's been a money grab lately. The last couple of years now. Oh yeah, and now that it's blown up, that whole. The whole driver control or uh, driver opinion thing. Uh, some stuff's yeah. happened around that that might be changing how hard it is for other teams to get onto the grid. And that's just the way people are taking it. Like, uh, yeah. after all the backlash, Ben Slam's now stopped, or he's essentially relinquished control of F1 to F1 and said, like, fine, like, we're not making the statements then. Like, he's not being the primary point of contact for anything anymore. It's uh, Tombasis now, I believe. Uh, but, like, people are saying that, that, like, what this is doing is it's actually giving F1 more of their dis- more of their own decision-making control. And one of the big negatives I saw brought up, because this was a Twitter article that I found, or Twitter po- tweet, whatever you call it, uh, that I found it on. So, you know, you get the world's opinion underneath it. And one of the yeah. things that somebody said was uh, the thing nobody's talking about is Ben Salam is the person who was the hardest pushback against the Saudis trying to buy F1 recently. F1 wanted to let it happen. He said no. Because and people are, I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that a specific ownership is a problem or a specific country having ownership of something is a problem, but clearly they see problems in what they are doing with leagues that they own i don't know i guess you could see like liv and how they're threatening the pga and they don't want to let it go i feel yeah. like i feel like we would lose a lot of proper races and we'd end up with a lot of these quickly fabricated street circuits i mean it's it's saudi has been all over the place not even just in motorsport um, LIV is a great example. I mean, LIV was small. They were they weren't really anything, and then all of a sudden they blew up. And the amount of money that's been poured into that is unreal. Golfers being paid two hundred million dollars just to show up. Yeah, and that's on that example. That's the big thing that PGA is worried about is that someone like the the Saudis is just a general statement but the people of that side of the globe have a yeah. significant amount of the world's wealth and they mm-hmm. essentially have a non-stopping fountain of money that will go into it to make it yeah. work until it's better than what you have and you don't have viewership yeah I mean I, I mean like the the most recent example is the new contract that Cristiano Ronaldo signed uh the highest paid um athlete ever yeah and he's at the very end of his career nowhere near the skill set yeah just here's money for name and viewership yeah it's like i I don't remember what it was it was like 95 million dollars a year or something like that yeah and again it's no it's no shame to them but what i see in that is you take away from the quality and you throw everything at flashy yep and it would dilute the sport no matter what one we're talking about yeah so i mean you look at so you look at what saudi money has done to other sports i am almost on board with what the fia has done with trying to keep the saudis out yeah at the same time like liberty media has done a great job yeah why do they want to sell i mean they i haven't heard anything before the abrupt statement that they were let someone was trying to buy them that they were like you know we're looking to sell yeah they're making more money than ever they have the largest calendar ever why like take on the more drivers make more money don't sell the yeah. league because i did see the other day that when the opportunity comes whether that's 2026 or earlier or beyond they will be looking to add two teams yeah i think that would be the easier way to do it I agree. Especially, like, fuck, that spawns a different conversation. But, like, you look at, uh, I I forget who posted it, uh, but someone had said that they're 
they've officially listed the engine suppliers for 26 for the new regs. Mm -hmm. There's six of them. Six. So... And six different engine suppliers. Inst That's insane. Yeah. Renault. We have what four yeah. now? We have right now we have Mercedes, Honda, Red Bull, uh, Renault, and, and Ferrari. Ferrari. And then in twenty six, it's Ferrari, Renault, Mercedes, Honda, Red Bull, or no, sorry, Honda, Red Bull, Ford, and who was the other one? Audi. Okay, so now the, the the Honda confuses me. Honda wants back in. I think Honda is going to take AlphaTauri as its own team because they've been wanting to separate from or like fully, fully separate. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's going to become Honda. You're going to have Red Bull. Those two teams, like one of them's going to end up as Audi's part, uh, customer team or their second team. And the other one might be Honda's. I mean, that would make sense. The uh, Speaking of Honda, actually, you know who they're in talks with? Or uh, have you seen who they're in talks with for engine engines and stuff? I have not. McLaren. Really? Yeah. I saw that, uh, I believe it was while I was at school today, I saw it pop up uh, that they're in talks with them. And it's like, you want to jump ship again. That means you're throwing, what, the next four years in the bag. Or if you're starting yeah. 26, you're assuming you're starting on a wrong foot because you, I don't know, you have to design the chassis around the engine. That's why you see such a variance based on the suppliers. Yeah. I, I do think that if the Mercedes engine is not what it's meant to be this season, mm -hmm. I think they have, I think they're in the right to look elsewise because I think personally outside of the 2021 car, um, they've had the worst luck with the engine supplier. Well, I still think, like, I wonder what that is, because that can't be, like, a Mercedes problem. Did Aston have that many bad engines last year? I like, don't I, think so. I don't they think just... so. Mercedes was pretty reliable. I mean, they'll always get yeah, the best engine. Yeah, they've always been, yeah. But, uh... And Williams was pretty decent. So it's like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I wonder if it's a packaging issue or if, like, if it's the way that they tried to take their aero platform in the back end, it's compromising. Like, the only thing I can think of is overheating and overstressing. Like, yeah. And you can't really overstress because tires are fixed, weights are fixed, wheels are fixed. Maybe you're running, like, super aggressive transmission stuff. But they didn't really have tranny issues. They just had, like, engines not fucking working. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, yeah, I would definitely say Mer Mercedes has the most reliable. Um, Ferrari, on the other hand, I would say the complete opposite. I still think it was purposeful. Like, I still I think agree, that though. was full-fledged to upgrade their engine. And that's why I'm 100% on board with the rumor that their car is one second faster this year. I am One second faster is absurd. It is absurd, but the test track is Barcelona. Like that's always the that's always the reference track. It's it's the fucking preseason testing track. You get the most raw data from Barcelona. They'd have to compare off of that. The Ferrari was very strong at Barcelona. Was it not? I think I it remember was... back because it was so early on. I know Carlos screwed himself because he kept driving into the sand. Yeah, he beached it on lap one, I think. No, lap one beaching it was uh, Australia. I saw that in a meme review today. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. The thing was like Bottas every once in a while, or not Bottas, uh, Science every once oh. in a while for some reason. And it's the, I forget what movie it's from, but it's the the video of the one big black guy and the other guy, and they go lay down on the the stack of money. But it, but it's the guy just laying down in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, that's science. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But yeah, um, no, the like, I'm fully, maybe, yeah, one second's a ton of difference. But I'm fully believing that that car is faster this year, like significantly. Yeah. 
second a second is a lot it's... that's almost like concerning to a degree but like I don't know man you can gain a second very easily in Formula 1 though it depends like you can plant I'm trying to think like you can plant a specific issue in an engine very easily so I'm saying things like if they found a way to improve like turbo efficiency or if they found a way to improve like thermal efficiency in the engine like what if like most most formula 1 engines are up to like 40% efficient what if they're cl- yeah. what if they were able to get it closer to 50 55 like that mm-hmm. could be huge you're making more power per piston pump however you want to look at it but like they they very easily could have made some significant upgrades to that engine and i mean the hybrid plant too like that's not frozen so if they get a more efficient way of developing the hybrid or like actually transmitting the hybrid power or storing it or whatever it may be yeah there's a lot of factors in formula one and it's always changing is the thing exactly like who knows maybe this could be another one of those this is a completely legal upgrade that we're gonna have to ban because it'd be too expensive for everybody to implement yeah I still would love to see what the entire grid would look like with DOS. The silence. Uh, Mercedes dual axis steering. Sorry, I'm reading. Sorry, I'm reading. That's I'm reading okay. Quick. Very good. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, DOS, DOS, DOS. I remember DOS. Um, like, didn't didn't play much of a, a factor. I feel in the last year or maybe two. No, but it was banned immediately. Uh was it banned? Yeah, they had to get they had to take it off the car. I didn't think they did. I they, thought they, they did deemed because it legal. that's it was legal, but they Mercedes was deemed not allowed to use it. There's been two more going into this year that I'll go on about in a second, mm-hmm. but because it it is within the rules, but it gives too much of an advantage that it is unfair to the other teams and would be too costly to be a part to mandate. It's the same reason why things like the J damper were banned back in the old days. It was an extremely effective way of getting around things, and it wasn't illegal in any way, but it was too much of an advantage. This year, you know that fancy Aston rear wing? Yeah. That's not allowed. The new Mercedes front wing that they got in the back half of the season is not allowed. The one with the cuts in the side of the front wing? Mm Mm-hmm. That's not allowed this season. Wow. It's like, okay, it wasn't an illegal part because they were allowed to race with it all season. They're just like, we're just not going to allow that going forwards. Yeah. Like for a team to develop what Aston did in the rear wing in the tunnel, I mean, how many CFD hours is is that each? A lot. Like plus wind tunnel, modeling. Yeah. And then development for race day. Dang, I I did not know. Ah, Dang, I must have missed that. Yeah. About DOS getting banned or removed from their car. Look back at uh, d- you don't remember? I, I just googled when, it. When uh, they I think it was Miami. No, it wasn't Miami. Maybe when they thought there was a big thing because people thought they saw Lewis moving his steering wheel in and out. Wasn't that Austria? Might have been, but it turned out that it wasn't. They're just like it's not because we can't have DOS. Oh, I think it was Australia. Is what it was. But, yeah, I remember them, like, it did kind of look like he did, but at the same time, like, yeah. It's a shame. I, I'm i fully for, like, if you <coughs> found out how to do it, you should be able to go. But I feel like that could also very quickly let one team run three seconds ahead. Yeah. So, I don't know. Actually, here's here's a question for you. This is something I, I uh, right. proposed to um, Felipe Botella in Division 2 when we were doing a Formula 1 Pre, pre-race show for a different league. Changing the structure of DRS. Insta- in what way? Instead of getting DRS when you are inside one second from the car in front, <clears throat> you get DRS when you're outside one and a half seconds. To bring them back in. 
to actually close the field, not promote overtaking. You can't get straight line speed? Okay, well you get DRS down two straights. Teams can't focus on a straight line car because you still have 90% of the track to drive. Hmm. That is pretty plausible if you think about it. But the issue I see in it is there's already cars that already struggle with overtaking even with DRS. Right. So without DRS, I feel like there's just going to be no overtaking at all. Well, it'd be, well, you look back to the old days. There was no DRS. There was overtaking like crazy. It's more about raw skill. They want to close the field. I feel like that'd be more effective. Like bring yeah. the cars closer together. And cars were, I felt, were more different than they are now. Like, each no doubt, team they were had... half the fucking size. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that it is relatable. I feel like it's a little different. But nowadays, with regulations, with certain parts being illegal, as you have said previously, I think it's we're getting to the point where almost all the cars are the same. Yeah. A little bit of a so spec I, series. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't be opposed of it to try it out and see how it is, but I think the amount of overtaking would be significantly reduced and it would just be no to, nose to tail for 20 cars, maybe. Now that Latifi's gone. <laughs> for real. Rest <laughs> in peace, Mr. Safety Car himself. RIP in peace. But, like, I don't know. The. How do I put this? How do you do it? How do we do? I don't know. I don't know how to put it. I think my brain's just tired and ready to watch these cars race because I'm I'm done with the off season. Yeah, well, we do have thir thir 13 days, I believe, till testing. Oot, oot, oot. So it's right around the corner. Yeah, and that first race will be not too long after, so yeah. very excited for that. And I think I'm going to spend some time watching that in the off week during Valentine's, because, yeah. I believe um, the two weeks after we finished my Sano, the Formula One testing, I believe, will be as, will have started by then. Perfect. So we will get to see what happens on day one and two by the time we record that episode. That's right. We'll have, we'll have an entire section dedicated to just tinfoil hat comments about exactly. all of the non-valuable information that we get from preseason testing because it never tells us anything of worth. No, it's usually just a bunch of clowning is what it is. The only thing I know is if Mercedes looks strong, they're not fighting this year. No. They, uh, but if every... they're towards the back. It'd be we'll worried. See. Yeah. So on that note, it's been Josh. It's been Bailey. It's been the SRA Grid Report. And we'll see you next week. Or we won't. Happy Valentine's Ooh. Day.